The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the great museum art sell-off in the US. Is it right to sell works from public collections and is there a market for them? In the trade, it's known as deaccessioning, the selling of works from public museums. And in the wake of COVID-19, as museums struggle to survive, it's prompted a controversy, as the Association of Art Museum Directors, or AAMD, in the US temporarily lifted a rule that stated that museums could only sell works of art to acquire others. And various museums have taken advantage of the relaxation to sell art from their collections. I talked to Christopher Bedford, the director of the museum at the centre of the most controversial deaccessions, the Baltimore Museum of Art. Georgina Adam, editor-at-large for the art newspaper and a specialist in the art market, tells us about what this means for the art trade. And I speak to Jim Duff, a former museum director and former chair of the Professional Issues Committee of the AAMD, about the history of deaccessioning and the rules restricting it. And in this week's Work of the Week, the artist Jennifer Packer discusses a Chinese mural of the Buddha of Medicine in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Before all that, a reminder that you can read the art newspaper anywhere, anytime, with our iPhone and iPad app. Visit the App Store, search for the art newspaper, and then you can install the free app. If you're a subscriber, all the app content is available as part of your subscription. Now, next week, Sotheby's will sell three works from the collection of the Baltimore Museum of Art, or BMA. A bright yellow Last Supper by Andy Warhol from 1986, and abstract works by Clifford Still and Bryce Marden. The sales are being made in the hope of generating around $65 million, which would be used not to buy other works of art, as Baltimore and many other museums have done in the past, but for the direct care of their collection. This is possible, as I mentioned earlier, because of a decision in April by the AAMD to loosen restrictions on deaccessioning. Under a two-year moratorium, museums are now free to use sales revenue to finance collection care, as well as using endowment funds, trusts or donations for general operating expenses. The Brooklyn Museum has already seized on the relaxed rules, selling its only painting by Lucas Cranach the Elder and eight other works through Christie's Old Masters and European auctions. The Everson Museum in Syracuse offered a Jackson Pollock drip painting, also at Christie's, and netted $12 million. But the BMA sale of Warhol, Steele and Marden is the one generating the most controversy and lacerating op-eds from critics and specialists. I spoke to the BMA's director, Christopher Bedford, about the sales. Chris, before we get into all of the discussion that's been going on recently, I just wanted to know, why did you choose these three works? Uh, So we, we, as does every museum, went through um, a long, searching, discerning process of discovery, combing through the museum's collection, looking for objects that we believe would not significantly detract from the history of art that we um, tell our audiences. And I think that 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 conviction is driven by the idea that the the fundamental public trust that we serve as a museum, that every museum serves, um, is our community. So this this concept that an institution exists um, to serve its collection, I think is, in my view, fundamentally faulty. I think that we, as an institution, exist to serve our community. That is a principle of action at the BMA, and it's one of the principles of action that guided the process around deaccessioning. So we wanted to make sure that any action we took wouldn't significantly detract from the complex polyphonic stories that we can tell our public. And that's what led to the three objects um, that were recently deaccessioned by the Board of Trustee vote on October 1st. Okay. And and um, were these three works earmarked earlier? So obviously you've been through this lengthy process where you had sold works and you have brought in more works by African-American artists, for instance, and women. Um, were these three works identified as long ago as that or was that was it a new process that identified these three? It was a new process um, that was initiated about six months before the decisive vote Um, that landed on these objects uh, for deaccessioning, yes. The discovery process that led to the identification of these three objects began about six months in advance of the October 1st date. So it was a a fresh process of discovery um, led by Dr. Asma Naim, who was our chief curator, and Dr. Katie Siegel, who is a senior curator at the museum. 
Right. And so that's interesting because it, it was it was in advance of the lifting of the restrictions in terms of deaccessioning. So this was a process that, you know, it wasn't that the ruling from the AMD said that you had a two year moratorium in which you could deaccession to raise funds for collection care uh, prompted you to reinvestigate the collection and choose these three works. That discussion was already in place. No, no. So I do, I do want to clarify that. So it was AMD's new resolutions that were issued in April that did precipitate um, this discussion. And as you know, AMD's resolution says that you can use proceeds from deaccessioned art to fund direct care of collection. And so we, it was um, that loosening of restrictions for a temporary period that caused us to go through this process of discovery and investigation. And just to be clear, you've said that the museum is not in financial straits. So this isn't a financial decision, a necessary financial decision in order to, for instance, keep the collection going in ways that you wouldn't be able to had you not sold them. So I, what I would say to that is that we are not in desperate financial straits to the same extent that other institutions that are heavily reliant on earned revenue, i.e. people coming through the door, are. Um, I think we, like every other institution, could not survive were the COVID-19 period um, to extend indefinitely. So I do want to emphasize that shoring up the financial basis of the institution and protecting ourselves from comparable vulnerabilities in the future was an animating principle that the board was incredibly invested in too. Right. Okay. Let's talk about the works themselves. The Warhol first off, this is a work that has been described in the press as iconic. I would dispute the the term iconic personally, but it's it's obviously from a major series. And I'm just curious about why it was this late work by Warhol that you chose to deaccession. I, I I concur. I would dispute the term iconic too and its application in this case, and I believe Andy Warhol would too push against that. And I think the that is fundamentally inscribed in his interest in duplication. So the icon was not of interest to him. He was interested in replicating the icon. Um, so in terms, though, of, of landing on that particular painting, um, we are fortunate to have incredibly rich holdings in Warhol and particularly, particularly late Warhol. And so one of the fundamental tenets of deaccessioning is this concept of collection-based redundancy, and that has to do with storytelling. So we felt um, very great conviction around the concept, as did the the Board of Trustees, that we could still advance to our audiences an incredibly convincing and comprehensive history of Warhol's achievement as an artist, absent that painting resting on the 90 or so other objects that, that remain in our collection. So um, to me, it was a relatively straightforward decision that also has the happy consequence of ex- securing an extraordinary future for the institution. Right. Now, one of the contentions of this letter that's been written to the Attorney General and to the Secretary of State in Maryland is that by selling it in a private sale through Sotheby's, you may be undervaluing that work and therefore not raising as much as you might be able to were it to go to auction. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Well, I would fundamentally push back on that. I think that 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 just displays a lack of command of the way the market works. Um, Sotheby's, I think, is more than adequately incentivized to maximise Um, the yield from that painting and felt very strongly for reasons they articulated the private sale, which is absolutely conventional for museums, was the best route to maximize gain for this painting for the BMA at this time. And I think the, the idea that there is no competition through private sale is itself a fallacy. So it isn't public competitive bidding that doesn't mean that there isn't substantial private competition. They felt very strongly that this was the best sales mechanism. The f- amount that's being said in the press that this may raise is about forty million. Is that your understanding? Um, I, so again, I would like to protect Sotheby's capacity to um, deliver the maximum result to us and not comment on on numbers in particular. I think that will become public record in due course. Right. Um, let's move on to the Clifford Steele. I have to say, this is the one that I have the biggest problem with of the three. The, the reason being that Clifford Steele made, gave this work as a gift yes. to a museum that was his essentially his local museum. He was living in Maryland for 20 years at the end of his life. Um, it is the single object by Clifford Steele that is in the collection. 
how do you justify its sale? And I know, you know, I'm, I'm curious because I know that, that it seems to me that this is the work that people seem to have the most emotional connection with in terms of the critiques. Um, so I would, I would push back gently, of course, against the idea that Clifford Still was in any meaningful sense a local artist. I think he lived out the tail end of his life in Maryland. I don't think that this state was central to his identity. And, and it is true that the institution, the BMA, um, did make a proposal to Clifford Still that this be the, the sort of the final resting place of his body of work. He... Um, rejected that concept outright and gave the institution um, just one painting in 1969, which is quite unusual in the scheme of the artist giving, where he, he restricted paintings and gave them en masse. So our painting is completely unrestricted and a single object, which makes it a little bit unusual. Um, in terms of the, the logic, um, and I appreciate and recognize you, your question here, um, we we are very fortunate at the institution to have um, Katie Siegel, whose work I'm sure you you know well, um, working in the capacity of senior curator. And although um, uh, being the director of the institution, I come to this this comment with all due bias. I do believe that she is the living authority on post-war American abstraction, uh, peerless in that category. Um, the argument she made is that we, given our holdings are more than positioned to tell a very fulsome history of the post-war period in abstraction in the United States absent the specific autographic contribution of Clifford Still. It does not diminish our storytelling capacity, nor does it diminish um, the extent to which we as an institution can meet the public trust in telling that story. And... Um, I believe wholeheartedly in her and in her scholarship and in her command. Um, I believe in that principle. And it was on that basis that um, we made the decision. Um, I would also say, although this is slightly tangential to your question, that the ABEX story itself needs to be significantly pressured and complicated. And we, as, a, as public institutions, have not done good enough work on that front historically. And I think one really good example is that we added our first painting by the great African-American abstract painter Norman Lewis only um, two years ago to the collection. He was completely absent from our story. There are many others that need to be added. And so we will further complicate that story by um, adding more voices to the, you know, the canon of ABEX. And in part, um, Clifford Still's absence, quote unquote, will enable that diverse history. And so we feel very strongly about the decision. One of the tricky things I would imagine you would have to balance in your considerations is where does community begin? Where does it end? Who sh you have diverse communities, right? So there were, and, and surely that among those communities, there will be people who have an enormous attachment to individual works and they may be the Warhol, they may be the Steel, they may be the Marden. How do you, how do you deal with the visitor who walks through the door of the BMA and says, where's the Clifford Steel in the future? You know how, how have have you thought about how in you know how it, your your um, staff meet meet the public in the eye about about the deaccessioning? Mm -hmm. We uh, we've done um, a tremendous amount of work socialising these concepts, particularly with our front of house staff, who are the principal stewards, of course, of the the public experience. Um, so I do want to talk about this concept of um, community, and I do think it's important to note that Baltimore is a sixty eight percent black city. And um, we have not adequately either represented or engaged that community in our history. So, and this is well known at this point, that, that has become a singular focus of our institution going forward. Um, so so when, we, when we discuss this idea of public trust and connection, um, I do want to emphasize that we have a lot of trust building still to do. And um, with that 68% majority, the effort has to be, I think, quite exaggerated in recognition of what has not been done historically. Um, and so just to speak in very frank and forthright terms with you, um, I think that the maintenance of a status quo history of art um, with a default white center is not something that is sustainable in a black majority city because it's frankly rooted in a system of power that has become now commonly known as white supremacist. Unless you actively push back against those systems, they simply remain in place. And that, that is a very big part of our agenda. The staff is very clear about it and the board is very clear about it. Okay. So 
In terms of the money that will be raised from these sales, though, is it right that, in a way, you're addressing the collection care, as you say, and that includes staffing, as opposed to purchasing more works by African-American artists or more diverse artists from um, um, an African diaspora, for instance, or indeed works by non-white artists from throughout the world. So in other words, the earlier deaccessioning was very specifically targeting on diversifying the collection. This is There's another form of diversifying that's going on that will result from these funds. Yeah, that's correct. So um, the, way, the way I conceived this, um, the way the staff refined it and the way the board approved it is sort of roughly as follows. I think that we have done extraordinary work as an institution in focusing on being diverse in the way that we represent. So meaning exhibitions, acquisitions, and public programs. But I think what became increasingly urgently apparent to me, particularly during the lockdown period, is that simply representing isn't enough. Um, that's a way not of living your mission and vision, but rather simply um, hanging it on the wall. And so the light bulb went on for me looking at a very particular painting by Kerry James Marshall, um, which you may or may not know, which is in the collection of Glenstone, has been reproduced in tandem with some of these art- some of the writing about our endowment for the future initiative. But it depicts a black-centered museum in a neoclassical building. So the effort was to move beyond program and towards policy, and to make sure that we were modeling an idea of equity within our walls to create a kind of three hundred and sixty degree view of an institution's mission, um, moving beyond rhetoric to a kind of lived experience for our staff and our audience as well. That's the really true animating impulse here. And in terms of like the staffing, there's been a lot of conjecture, it seems to me, about um, staff salaries. Can you clarify exactly who will be getting a pay rise as a result of this? Yeah, I can be very, very clear about that. So um, as you know, roughly uh, $55, $54 million will be put in an endowment for direct collection care. That amount of money spins off roughly $2.5 million a year. Um, A big percentage of that will be distributed across our staff structure to achieve pay equity um, up and down the hierarchy. Within that, there is a tremendous emphasis on those people at the bottom end of our compensation spectrum. So not the curators, rather front of house staff, so security officers and VSAs. So at the moment, just to give it specific monetary context, um, our entry level security officer at the moment makes $13.50 per hour. That is not a livable wage. And we're asking those people to guard our priceless works of art. And I think that that struck us all as fundamentally, indefensibly inequitable. And so we wanted to achieve a system in which we were at base and first and foremost, paying those front of line staff a living wage. So that translates into a starting entry hourly wage of $20 an hour, which annualized is $40,000 a year, which is certainly not a fortune but it's livable. And so it, there is the very first emphasis within our distribution of pay equity. And then we will begin looking up and down the, the hierarchy, and we've already done this, of course, um, to identify where people are not being paid appropriately and proportionally for the work they're doing to advance our mission. There's been this letter sent to the Secretary of State and the Attorney General of Maryland, as I mentioned. Um, I wonder, has there been any contact from the Secretary of State or from the Attorney General in terms of what actions they may or may not be considering? Have you heard from them to tell you that you are clear to go ahead or that they may be considering this petition from the from the letter? Of course, we are in receipt of that letter too. And I did want to take just one moment, if you'll, if you'll permit me to comment and say, um, I think one of my fundamental objections to some of the coverage around this is the assumption that the claims made in that letter are true. Well, of course, they are positions and in many cases deeply false and um, and demonstrably so. So I just want to be very clear about that. Specious claims advance to um, make a point. So uh, yes, the Attorney General and the Secretary of State are in receipt of that. Um, we've indicated our willingness to be highly collaborative in um, with both of those entities in, in achieving the just result. And um, we, 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 we've made that overture. Um, they are aware, and um, as as far as um, I'm aware, that, that that is where the condition stands at the moment. I'm conscious that the Secretary of State and the Attorney General may 
be equally symp- sympathetic towards the museum and towards your policy because there is a reckoning right now going on about institutions and uh, institutional and systemic bias etc do you, have you had any response from them to your aim for equity across your institution for instance do they have they shown public support from it and therefore might they publicly support your deaccessioning of these works so we have not um heard reflected back to us any particular p- position on the part of the uh, attorney general relative to our equity based agenda but i will say um, that it strikes me that you you make a very solid point because the vast majority of institutions in this country are not under fire um, because that they are making great strides in achieving pay equity or diversifying their staff or diversifying their holdings. Rather, they're being held to account by activist groups for doing nothing in those categories. Um, I think what's very interesting about this circumstance is that we are being held to account by a petition signed exclusively, almost exclusively, um, by a very privileged elite um, who are calling not for change, but rather the maintenance of a status quo from yesteryear. So it's an incredibly different dynamic going on with us. Um, we're, We're actually being told by the ruling class that what we're doing is not acceptable, when what we're trying to do is advance a new and more just future for the museum. In the article that Asma Name and Katie Siegel wrote for the art newspaper, they talk about strong public support for the deaccession. Is that in reference to the historic deaccession, as in the 2018 one that we talked about earlier, or have you consulted the public about this particular round of deaccessioning? I mean, it's a it's a reference to both deaccessionings. I think um, again, Baltimore is a black majority city and um, has been waiting a long time for a fundamental change in the way that the arts are oriented within the city. And one interesting anecdote I can relay is um, we're fortunate to have Amy Sherald on our board. And I remember in an early board meeting, um, I was doing what directors do, which is stand in front of the board of trustees and make their point. And while making those points, I, I said that the Baltimore was ready for this change. And she took me aside afterwards and said... And I will always remember this. I support everything you're doing wholeheartedly, but I want you to know that Baltimore has been ready for this change. You're just now catching up. So I think that's incredibly important to note. Baltimore has been ready and has been supportive. We're just now delivering the goods. That's interesting. My last question is about the future. If these sales go through and everything else, I wonder, are you at all concerned about future acquisitions in terms of gifts and donations because obviously in this case Marden Bryce Marden is a living artist Clifford still gave that work as we mentioned to the museum are you concerned that these actions might put people off from donating to the museum donating works to the museum in the future or do you feel that you are appealing to new constituencies who are the donors of the future I I feel very, very strongly that the artists that we work with, that the collectors we work with, foundations and corporations are all incredibly value aligned and they envision the same future that we do. Um, Trust in us to do everything necessary to secure that future. And I think what you will see in the coming months and years is an investment in being even more generous through financially and through art and support of that mission and vision. So no, I don't think that this will be a deterrent in the least. In fact, I think those donors will see us putting our money and our blood and treasure where our mouth is to advance that future and they'll do the same. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. You can read an opinion piece on the BMA sales by Martin Gammon and the response that I mentioned from Asma Naim and Katie Siegel of the BMA online at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. The sale of the works, if it goes ahead, is on the 28th of October. Now, how's the market reacting to the sale of works by museums? I spoke to our editor-at-large, Georgina Adam, about the effect on the trade. Georgina, is it the holy grail for auction houses, dealers, etc., when museums want to deaccession their works? I think that uh, any work that's been in a museum and so has had that institutional validation is extremely attractive. 
But of course, museums do have in the back rooms uh, works that are never shown to the public that perhaps are not in very good condition. So it really rather depends. Their top works are, of course, the works that attract the public. The unseen ones are probably the ones they'd like to dispose of, but are less attractive as, as selling propositions. OK, so that is what makes the particularly the Baltimore Museum's works and indeed the Brooklyn Museum's works particularly important here isn't it because you know the the Warhol the Clifford Steel and the Bryce Marden are all works that in you know on the face of it would be enormously attractive to collectors they're not they're not taken out of the storerooms a bit in dodgy condition or minor works these are pretty important things Absolutely. This is really, really contentious. The fact that they're selling, I mean, quite frankly, the crown jewels in some cases. Uh, but on the other hand, that's the way they're going to make money. And they do need a lot of money with the pandemic. Right. So so can you tell me a bit about how this sort of thing works? So um, because I, I, I'm aware that the machinations of how museums and auction houses might work in these circumstances might not be something that we're aware of. So So would a museum directly approach an auction house would they approach multiple auction houses and offer you know and ask for bids for the works well of course this is one of the questions that uh, there's been an open letter sent uh, about the warhol saying that the museum did not do its due diligence we just don't know i wouldn't have said that the museums would necessarily have approached the auction houses i would have thought that the auction houses are always talking to museums. I mean, the prime case, of course, was the Detroit um, Institute of Art, when the Detroit was in such trouble. And there's no doubt that the auction houses and indeed Christie's was brought in to, to put a value on the collection. So the auction houses are aware. They know that American museums can sell, which is not the case in other countries. For example, in France, it's forbidden by law. But in America, you can sell up until now, the guidelines of the AAMD said that you had to sell in order to buy something else. Uh, now, of course, there's been this relaxation. So I think that the auction houses and probably dealers as well are always in contact with museums in the case that something might come up for sale at some point. Right. So let's again, because we've just spoken to Christopher Bedford, I think it's really useful to look at those works in the Baltimore Art Museum and talk about them in terms of what they would, how significant they are in terms of the market. So talk us through those three works. So you've got the, the Warhol Last Supper, you've got an abstract painting by Bryce Marden, and you've got an abstract painting by Clifford Still. How much demand is there among collectors for these works? I think that there will be great demand, but it's very interesting because the Warhol is not being offered at public auction. The thing with Warhol is that over the last two years, that market has definitely softened. There was um, there's a family of art dealers in New York that had really sustained that market and the McGrabies, and they had uh, they had apparently bought a bit less. And so perhaps the advice to sell it privately is probably good. Um, as far as the other two are concerned, yes, they're enormously attractive. I mean, um, the still is interesting because the artist himself was very restrictive in what he allowed to be done with his works. And so this is really quite rare to have this. The problem with the modern is that the artist is still living. And to sell a work by a living artist is, I know these are exceptional times, but in a sense, it is a sort of disavowal, you could say. I mean, the famous case was back in the day when Charles Saatchi disposed of all of his holdings of an Italian artist called Chia. And it completely bombed, his market bombed afterwards, and he was furious about that. Now, this isn't the, entirely the same case, because obviously Martin is it's a very, very well-established artist and a, a prime work. I think there will be appetite for these works. I think that they'll do well, but we are talking about a market that is soft. Um, the sales that we've seen of other works have been successful, but then if you compare them with the sort of sales that were held before the pandemic, it's not nearly as strong. On the whole, these well-known works by well-known artists, when they've been offered at sale recently, have 
just about made low estimate. They really haven't soared. What is making a lot of money? Are, are these more, shall I say, speculative artists, uh, artists of colour, women artists? And those really we've seen doubling, tripling more of estimate. We haven't seen that with this more what you might call blue chip art. So I don't think we'll see anything spectacular happen with these two. I think they will sell well uh, within the estimate. Right. What about the the Brooklyn Museum works? Because we have we actually have evidence of a museum selling deaccessioning works and selling them through Christie's in this instance. Um, how did they fare against estimates? Well, it's really interesting because it um, Christie's obviously was very happy to see their Cranach do terribly well. The Cranach that was sold. I think there were 12 works that were sold initially by Brooklyn. The Cranach made just over $5 million, which was almost double estimate. So that was a great result. But if you look at the results of the others, one didn't sell. Um, most of them didn't, in fact, make low estimate. But they were more minor works. So the total of the Brooklyn deaccessions was $6.8 million dollars. But the Cranach was five million of that. Right. They did do well with one rather damaged, non-identified Neerlandische old master, which went to two hundred thousand or so over an estimate of about forty or fifty. I can't remember the exact price. So what we're seeing is it really is only the very best works and the top works, the rare ones. The Cranach was very rare. And of course, if you look at the Everston disposal of its Pollock. Um, that was estimated at 12 to 18 without fees, and it only just made low estimate. Right. So it does seem that there's price resistance at the higher level, whether something is from a museum or not. It's really interesting, this idea that there's a sort, there were sort of modestly successful sales, because what we're reading in the newspapers is that while the poor have got poorer and many of us are struggling, billionaires seem to be doing pretty well, frankly, through the f through the pandemic. Do you think it's just a few who seem to be sustaining the art buying and they're just reaping the benefit of a smaller range of collectors out there? Why are we seeing modest sales? If the rich are still rich and getting richer, why, why would we have a, a more modest auction sales? There is a specificity about the art market that it is so reliant on supply. And just looking at the figures, if you don't really know what's going on, doesn't tell you the whole story. Yes, sales are enormously down compared to last year, but that's because people haven't sent things for sale, not because things have been sent for sale and haven't sold. The auctions that we've seen this year have actually had very good sold through rates, 80, 90%. So what is sent for sale has sold. Right. Uh, as for the polarization of wealth, yes, that's absolutely so. The, uh, you said, I think the rich have got a bit richer. The rich have got enormously richer uh, uh, under those who've got companies like Zoom, for example, which we're talking over at the moment. That company has done enormously well. Amazon, because people have been locked down, has done enormously well. And that's contributed to the massive wealth of these people. Um, that polarization is not entirely happening in the art market in the sense that we're not seeing works of art selling for enormous sums, such as obviously this, the, the outlier is the Leonardo da Vinci at 450 million. But we did see a Monet sell at 110 million last year. But in any case, that very top end of the market had cooled down. I think there's an American election coming up it's going to be highly contentious. I actually know people who say they have laid in stocks in case there's civil unrest after it. So I think people with money are, are holding off to see what will happen after the election. I think that's an impact. And there's just, you know, the political situation in the world is not good. So on the one hand, there's a situation in which high quality works are um, not being sent to auction. And then on the other hand, you've got a bunch of museums in dire straits who are beginning to sell their works through auction. Does that mean it may reignite the markets to some extent? Or even is there a risk of, of, of a flooding of the market if people are being cautious? Interestingly, I was watching a webcast in which Adam Linderman, who's very close to the market, he's a dealer and collector, he actually thought that museums could trigger a flood of works onto the market. 
Um, it's difficult to say at this point. I mean, we have seen about, I think, eight American museums taking advantage of the relaxation of the rules to sell, although some say it's not for that reason. Baltimore said that it wasn't for that reason. Um, but it's interesting that uh, the Brooklyn Museum, immediately after scoring $6.8 million with its initial round of disposals, went on to say they've got a whole lot more. Uh, interesting, it, with a different auction house which is, uh, must be upsetting for Christie's because <laughs> they, they, they successfully sold. But one doesn't know what negotiations went on behind, behind closed doors. So at the moment, we're not seeing a flood onto the market. But what I think is quite an interesting aspect is that museums have been, in any case, uh, deaccessioning in order to what they call diversify the collections, i.e. to buy more work by artists of color, uh, by women artists who, um, who had not had been underrepresented. And that's a, a good thing to do. And they're selling, quite frankly, dead white male artists. This happened last year with the Rothko, which was sold by SF MoMA. Uh, they made $50 million out of it. That was before the relaxation of the AAMD rules. And so they put that, um, that money into buying, diversifying the collection. So what is interesting to me is that the museums now that they can um, uh, deaccession, they're going to almost inevitably be deaccessioning works that are not the most fashionable in a way at the moment, since the fashion at the moment is for more diverse representation in museums. And the biggest increases in price have been for artists of color, women artists and living artists. So from the private buyer's point of view, the more speculative end and the end in which they can perhaps make, make money because ultimately some people are in the market to make money is, is not in um, a rather obscure old master, even if it is sold by a museum. Can you explain a bit about the difference between and effectiveness of private sales versus public auctions? Because this is one of the aspects, as you say, that has prompted a bit of controversy is that by selling it the Warhol via private sale, the museum may not reach top dollar. So can you explain a bit about the pros and cons of those two different routes? Um, so selling it to auction is uh, thought to be generally uh, an open process and it's very much favored by lawyers because it shows that they've done due diligence that it's put up in public to a public auction in the case of brooklyn there was a guarantee uh, which means that the auction house itself had guaranteed that brooklyn's works would be sold for a certain amount of money so uh, this is a public forum and anybody can come along and bid in a private sale uh, those works of art are offered to people who have shown interest in the past. For example, the auction house might have offered, say, a Warhol at auction last year. One person bought it, but they know who the three underbidders were. So they know those people are up for buying a Warhol and they will contact them and say to them, look, this Warhol is coming up for sale. Are you interested? So, uh, a private sale is, is carried out a bit like a dealer. The, the dealer would, would sell in that way, contact people that they thought were likely to buy it. However, there is one aspect of selling at auction, which people are often not aware of, is that when a work of art comes in for sale, quite often the, um, the auction house will say, well, would you like it guaranteed? And very often that guarantee will be put out to third parties i.e. outside people. There are a number of people who are known to do this. So actually, in a way, there is an auction before the auction because that work of art is offered to those potential guarantors. Now, in the case of Brooklyn, it was not a third party guarantee. The auction house itself guaranteed it. So the difference between the two, it's slightly blurred since often even an auction work has actually been shown and in any case is shown to potential buyers before the actual auction. 
Do you think there's any risk that museums will be put off deaccessioning works because of the furore around what's happening in Baltimore? In other words, there's been such a storm, there have been such lacerating critiques that it's it suddenly becomes a reputational issue. I think this is obviously not a decision that museums come to lightly anyway. And the furore obviously must make them even more careful about what they choose to deaccession. But, you know, in America, the support for the state support for museums is virtually non-existent. It's all on private patronage. And they really are. I mean, it's a, it's a crisis for museums and they have to find some way. And that shortfall that they've made when they were closed down, when they weren't selling the postcards, the, you know, the tickets and so on, they can't make it up. And their patrons, it all depends who their patrons are. If their patrons will step up to the plate and help them out, fine. But not all patrons have made an enormous amount of money either. And of course, you also have the problem that if they're selling things that have been donated to the museums, the patrons may not look at that with a very kind eye thinking, well, I've been supporting this museum and if I give them works of art, they might somewhere down the road dispose of them. So um, I think the furore is certainly making museums think hard but I think some of them really are in such trouble that they have to find some way of making money. Well, it's a fascinating subject. Georgina, thank you for coming on and explaining it to us. Thank you for having me, Ben. You can read Georgina Adams' article on this subject at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. And to have Georgina's monthly column delivered direct to your email inbox, subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Art Market Eye. You can do that on the website. Click on the newsletter link at the top right of the page. You can also sign up for our other newsletters there, including the book club. We'll learn more about the history of deaccessioning in a moment. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. Under a major settlement announced this week by the US Department of Justice, members of the Sackler family involved with Purdue Pharma have agreed to pay $225 million in civil penalties to resolve the government's allegations that the company's aggressive marketing of OxyContin caused doctors to overprescribe the opioid, leading to abuse and addiction. As Helen Stoilus writes, the Sackler family amassed a fortune through Purdue and several members supported cultural institutions in the US and the UK. After the company's involvement in the opioid crisis came to light, the artist Nan Goldin, who was addicted to the drug, organised actions against the Sacklers at museums and galleries that have accepted funding from the family, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Many institutions have announced that they will no longer be accepting Sackler donations. The settlement does not release the Sacklers or Purdue executives from criminal or civil claims in future lawsuits, the Justice Department said. Catherine Hickley writes that earlier this month, one or more attackers sprayed oil on about 63 artefacts, including Egyptian sarcophagi, sculptures and the frames of paintings in institutions on Museum Island in Berlin. The oily liquid left stains on the objects at the Pergamon, the Neues Museum and the Alta Nacional Galleria. Police are investigating the incident. A Gustav Klimt masterpiece stolen 23 years ago from the Ricci Oddi Gallery in Piacenza, Italy, will go back on display next month, Gareth Harris writes. Portrait of a Lady from 1916 to 17 was taken in February 1997. A gardener found the painting last December after removing a metal plate on an exterior wall. The work was concealed in a bag buried within a cavity. The painting will go on show on the 28th of November. In January, officials at the gallery announced that the work had been authenticated and is a genuine painting by Klimt. It's valued at 60 million euros. You can read these stories and much more at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. On October the 28th, Christie's American Art Department will present two live auctions in New York. Engage with the boldness and creativity of the American spirit and explore the personal art collection of the legendary entrepreneur and philanthropist T. Boone Pickens. Highlights include a selection of commissioned artworks of the family's ranch, as well as masterpieces by N.C. Wyeth, Frederick Remington and Thomas Moran. 
The American Art Auction features a wide range of important sculptures by Elie Nadelman and Augustus St. Gordons, alongside modernist paintings by Milton Avery and Charles Demuth, and 19th century paintings by Albert Bierstadt and James Buttersworth. Discover and bid on an array of extraordinary works. Find out more at christies.com slash pickens or just christies.com. Welcome back. Before we hear about the history of deaccessioning, don't forget to catch up with the art newspaper's other podcast, A Brush With, with in-depth artist interviews. Do subscribe to hear new episodes in the coming weeks. You can do that at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you're listening now. Now, James H. Duff is a former director of the Brandywine River Museum of Art in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, and a past chair of the Professional Issues Committee of the AAMD. I spoke to him in order to get a perspective on the rules and precedents of deaccessioning among art museums in the States. Jim, I'd like to set the scene in terms of what role deaccessioning has played in American museum history. Has deaccessioning happened almost right from the start of American museums? Well, I can't speak to the start, but uh, certainly in the 20th century, uh, it became a not uncommon practice. Uh, and the Association of Art Museum Directors long ago addressed that issue and addressed it in a document called Professional Practices in Art Museums, which set a standard that has been maintained to the present day. When you say that it set a standard, what did that standard entail? Well, I could read to you from the 2011 version of that standard, if you like. Uh, the AAMD, as the Association of Art Museum Directors is called, has revisited this issue every decade, each decade revising the document called Professional Practices in Art Museums with a two-year committee effort each time. And each time it's reaffirmed the standard that I'll read to you in its current fashion. Uh, syntactically, it's been changed a bit, but in essence, it's remained the same through all these years. Quotation, funds received from the disposal of a deaccession work shall not be used for operations or capital expenses. Such funds, including any earnings and appreciation thereon, may be used only for the acquisition of works of art in a manner consistent with the museum's policy on the use of restricted acquisition funds. In order to account properly for their use, the AAMD recommends that such funds, including any earnings and appreciation, be tracked separately from other acquisition funds. Right. So let's talk about that, because the, because the key difference, therefore, in the current lifting of restriction, this two-year moratorium, is that operations and capital expenses suddenly come into play, right? Well, operations to the extent, as the resolution apparently provides, that those funds are used for direct care of collections. But of course, uh, that takes us right into operations. It takes us into conservation budgets for laboratories, security, climate control, and other issues as well. Right. Now, in the past, have there been incidences where museums have tried to test the standard that you just read out to me? Have, there, have, have museums tried to push against it? Yes, some museums have. Uh, it's been a rare phenomenon. And the AMD has met to discuss that and to decide whether to impose sanctions in each case over decades. But do you accept that deaccessioning can be a sort of healthy thing for a museum to do? Is is was the view, you know, of the AAMD generally that it, it was was it was there a dim view of it, of deaccessioning in general, or did it, did it feel like it was something that was an option for museums to take when it could benefit that museum? Deaccessioning was always permitted and used according to standards to replenish the collection. One could say to improve the collection so that if a museum sold works of art uh, because it had duplicates or because the work was obviously not of sufficient quality, uh, it would use the, the proceeds to buy art for the collection that met the museum's mission 
and standards. What kind of view did the AMD take of uh, museums that wanted to sell, not because there were duplicates, but because, for instance, there was a more fashionable form of art that they wanted to acquire and they wanted to sell a less fashionable form of art in order to fund that? That decision would be up to the individual museum. Uh, The AMD would, I think, not have criticised such action. But would it have taken a view at all? Would it, for instance, would members of the board express concern at all about that kind of activity? I doubt it. Not members of the board, except as individuals. <laughs> there are, of course, contemporary art museums whose obligation is to keep up with trends in contemporary art. And for them, the kind of action you described is essential, not just permitted practice. Right, exactly. Now, one of the things that I'm really interested in is, and it, it, it relates particularly to one of the works that's in the Baltimore Museum of Arts group of works that they are selling, which is a work by Clifford Still, which was a gift from the artist to the museum. And I wonder, were there ever um, rules or standards set for particular types of uh, particular ways in which works had come into collections? So, for instance, would it be would you take a dim view of the idea of selling a gift it's always been understood that a museum had an obligation to donors to the extent that if an artist who donated a work was living the museum should go back to that artist and ask if the action they proposed was acceptable to him or to her uh, Likewise, if a family gave a gift and there were in relatively recent years and a member of that family was available, the museum, as a matter of moral principle, should go back to that family, to some family member, and at least inform them of the intended action. Can you tell me the AMMD obviously oversees the American museums? Was your perception that was that it was a community which had certain balances that sort of essentially kept them all on track and kept kept them sort of talking about these kind of issues? Oh, yes. Uh, first of all, the AMD set standards for art museums only, and in truth, only for its membership. Although there, was, there has always been the hope uh, that all art museums would follow the AMD's guidelines. Uh, And that membership has grown over the years, so that possibility has become more and more true. Uh, Each decade, the AMD has revisited its professional practices in art museums, its standards. And those standards in that document, which now is over 30 pages in its latest iteration, uh, includes considerations of governance, mission, policy, public programs, finances, legal matters, fundraising, et cetera, et cetera, the physical plant, as well as collections. So uh, there is overall consensus, and more so because even though there was a committee of 10 or so people each decade working to revise the document and reconsider standards uh, and improve the syntax, uh, the whole membership voted to adopt the document in each case. So indeed, uh, professional standards in art museums truly represents the values and the position of the vast majority of art museums in in the United States. I suppose one of the things about deaccessioning is there will always be individuals, visitors, who come to even even if it's a relatively minor work in a collection, who will have who will have a particular affection for a work of art and that may well be deaccessioned. Is that something that was in a way built into those kind of principles that, 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 that these are objects that belong to a public, not just a museum? That's exactly right. And that's one of the reasons to urge such a standard, to urge great caution in selecting works for deaccessioning and subsequent disposal through sale uh, or even through exchange with other museums. Uh, Art is the glory of mankind and we can never 
predict what an individual work of art's effect on an individual human being is going to be. We're all different and every work of art is approached by every individual in a slightly different way. Museums exist to collect and preserve the cultural patrimony and we can never predict what future generations will want and want to do with that art. Okay, well, Jim, thank you so much for talking to us about deaccessioning. You're very welcome. You can follow all the developments of the fast-moving stories around deaccessioning on the website. Now for this episode's Work of the Week. The artist Jennifer Packer has an exhibition opening at the Serpentine Galleries in London in November, and she's chosen to focus on a 14th century wall painting of the Buddha of Medicine by Shajaguru in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Jennifer spoke to our senior editor in New York, Margaret Carrigan, about the work, and you can see an image of it at theartnewspaper.com. Go to the podcast tab and search for this episode. Jennifer, you've selected Buddha of Medicine, which is in the Metropolitan in New York. When was the first time you came across this work? I first saw the Buddha of Medicine in um, probably in 2018 when I kind of like stumbled upon the, you know, Buddhist Chinese wing. I somehow had been going to the Met for many years and had never made a U-turn at the top of the great, you know, great hall stairs. Have you done any like research into it and what like it because it was ostensibly you know for a, a healing meditation kind of work I just wonder if you feel healed when you sit in front of it that would be great I have to like get more centered when I sit or something I feel like belief and devotion I, I, I see it in the painting it's like both in the way that it's made and the subject depicted it really, it really excites me. I'm like, yeah, this is somebody cared about the subject and cared about every, every, every inch of it. As Rilke says, to the creator, there's no poor or indifferent place. And I just, I, I feel that when I look at it. What about its making? What really stands out to you that shows this kind of level of care and and belief, as you say? Um, I think when you get close to the work, you, <laughs> you can. There are moments where. I, I think could just be their own painting. Like there's a, a moment where someone is holding a flower and I think they're br- sort of breathing. It looks like the way that the li- the lines around the flower are moving, that they're breathing it in. It's like that in and of itself is like something that if you stand far away, you, you can't tell from the, from the images. It's just like a work that you, you kind of have to experience in person. But I, I feel like every time I go, I can extract so much about, like care and observation. I feel like I can, even if I'm projecting, like I'm projecting an, an understanding of, of what those things mean to the, the, the person or people who made it. Um, and that really excites me. I think what's really interesting as you know, in relationship to when you talk about your own work too, is about this observational quality that, you try to not you know embody take on and bring to the work can you describe a little bit about what what you mean by observational or or what what goes into observing something in in a way that is empathetic and caring you know when you're in that room with this mural there i have this i like this distinct like this very specific reaction to some of the figures like the buddha figures that are that are um, situated in the room. They're, they're like relaxed. Their wrists are loose. They're leaning forward. They're, they're welcoming. It's very, very different from like (laughs) neoclassical sculpture. Like they're not, there isn't a rigidity. There's, there's like a flexibility to it. I wouldn't have thought that there was something that I could compare like the rigidity, weirdly enough of like a Rodin, like a man bathing to, to a Buddhist sculpture. I think a lot about um, like Egyptian, like documentation too, as like being so precise, like that the world around them, the information, their experiences 
mattered enough, like, like an Audubon watercolor or something that, that like there was this commitment to the, you know, evidence of, of things in the world. And I think this painting embodies that, like there are just moments of moments that are stylized, but are also so like parts of the image are just so based in clearly observing other people, like time spent with, with objects as well. Looking at your work, there are these really small moments in your paintings that feel rather abstract, where the figures are a little bit abstracted, but because of the kind of layering and the sense of time and just the way that you use color and, and, and light and things when in these, you know, that you can tell that there's many brushes over this one era and it's not finesse to look like, you know, you that it's like a precise moment, that that, that passage of time is really important within your canvases. I wonder if that speaks to you within this mural or if when you look at the mural, does it like give you inspiration to how to approach your own painting? For sure. Yeah. I think, um, there, I usually don't use the word abstraction. I use, I use the word dissolution, like that things start to break down or, um, become shrouded. Um, but I think what's exciting is like, with this mural, not only can you, as I'm saying, like extract like specific moments that in and of themselves are like so beautiful and worth just mulling over like outside of the larger narrative of the painting, but there's just an abundance of information. And so I, I, I started to think a couple years ago, maybe it was like eight actually, and that's not a couple about how to like fill a surface to the point where like things can feel abstracted through an abundance, like meaning can feel dissolved. Like there are these moments in this mural in which there are these, these circles and inside, like at the bottom, there are kind of three of them. And there's one with like sunflowers, I think one with lilies and I, you know, it's hard to kind of make out, but they seem like really innocuous, almost tangential moments when you're standing in front of it, like looking at this, you know, 10 foot seated figure or something. So I'm, I'm interested in like hierarchy and, and moments of focus. And I think this painting gives that. I'm also like really excited by the parts of the painting that I, that I can't reach. I can't see like what, I, but what I expect is that the top of the painting is like just as wonderful as, as every other part that there's like equal attention given that doesn't privilege a person standing or sitting in front of it, um, but it but it like almost privileges the maker who had access to to that part. That really excites me. That like there are moments of intimacy that differ between you know maker and viewer. Just out of curiosity, do you often find yourself drawn to Buddhist works, or was this kind of an outlier and just had a real effect on you when you found yourself in this gallery yeah I mean it's so the museum is like segregated um <laughs> and it, it's just like the way that figures and sculptures like you can see overlapping attitudes in in like modernist painting there's this there's this massive stone um piece that that almost looks like a Martin Wong you know um in that same exact room I'm not like I'm I'm more and more intrigued by what feels human about, like differently human, like less propped up about the Buddhist works in that room. Because I think that that's something that I'm looking for. And I feel like when I, when I look through European, like the European wing, you, you feel the, the staged quality, which also gives a sense of like self-importance that I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm looking, it's like, I'm looking at a sculpture of a deity who looks like, they're friends with me. And there's something really wonderful about that versus like going and looking at sculptures or paintings of, of a God who is like meant to make me feel small. Yeah. I guess I've been, I'm, I'm like particularly drawn to the accessibility, what feels more accessible about the works. Well, thanks so much for speaking with us today, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
Jennifer Packer's exhibition, The Eye is Not Satisfied with Seeing, is at the Serpentine Galleries in London from the 18th of November. And another solo show will open at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles in early 2021. The dates of that exhibition are to be confirmed. You can find out more about the wall painting at metmuseum.org. And that's it for this week. Do subscribe to the Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. Please subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so and give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can also find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The producers of The Week in Art are Julia Michalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks to Christopher, Georgina and Jim, to Margaret and Jennifer, and thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.